Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson, also known as Dharmasar Taro. And this is the 16th episode of our series on Nibbana. And last time I asked for some feedback and questions and I got some. However, the uh, issues that were raised led me to see that there's a lack of background in the people who are watching this series. So before going on with the planned uh, program about Nibbana, I want to address some of these issues in a little bit more depth. Now, if you've watched previous episodes, you know that the point of this program is how the original teaching of the Buddha was covered up by scholarship, by mental speculation, and by semantic manipulation of the terminology in the Buddha's teaching. So, this is an example of an overlay, a philosophical overlay, that was deliberately created to change the meaning of the Buddha's words. Now, this is still going on today. And what goes under the name of Buddhism, everywhere that I have seen it, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and especially in the West, is this kind of philosophical overlay covering the original meaning and intent of the Buddha's teaching. And the specific underlying theme is that the Buddha's method is being covered over by the yogic method. What's the difference? Briefly, the method of yoga is about control. Controlling the bodily posture, controlling the breathing, controlling the senses, controlling the mind. The uh, method of operation of the path of yoga is through the will, through the ego, making the identity strong. And along with this, of course, we get a philosophy that supports the ego, that supports the idea of the self that supports even the eternal self, the soul, or taking it to its logical extreme, that the soul, the self, is in a relationship with God, or even is actually God. <laughs> Ridiculous idea. But this is what's going on in yoga. In the Buddha's teaching, it's completely the opposite. We are strictly phenomenologists. We look at uh, life and what we can observe, and we accept that as real. So, for example, we don't see anything resembling a self. We don't see anything like a soul or an eternal identity. We don't see anything like a god or a creator and controller of everything. And we certainly don't imagine that we have a relationship with this god. Uh, what to speak of identifying with or becoming or merging with this god. <laughs> and the actual method of meditation in the Buddha's teaching is also completely different, completely opposite. Let me give you an example. Someone brought up a question about pranayama. Well, pranayama means to control the breathing. One sits down and breathes in a certain pattern, counting the duration of the inhalation, holding, and exhalation, and holding of the breath. Or one alternately counts the breaths themselves or breathes in a certain way. And this training is carried out 
in order to control the breathing and the movement of energy in the body and to master that uh, in order to give one's uh, powers, uh, certain mystical powers, mental powers, or even physical powers. So <laughs> in the Buddha's teaching, we also work with the breath, and this is called anapanasati. But in anapanasati, the whole idea is to simply observe, watch the breath, watch the in-breath, watch the out-breath, and simply notice, is it long, is it short, is it deep, is it shallow, is it fast, is it slow, and like that. Not to try to control the breath. In fact, we specifically avoid trying to control the breath. But we simply try to notice the breath and to notice our observation of the breath. So in other words, there's a kind of meta-consciousness. We observe the breath and then we observe our ob observation of the breath. Everything is done by awareness. Everything is done by mindfulness. Everything is done by allowing things to be the way they are. And the philosophy is also like that. We don't posit the existence of a self or an I. In fact, by observing how the I is created, we see that it's actually... Uh, false. It's actually simply a mental model, a speculated entity. It has no phenomenological existence. If you go looking for your eye, you won't find anything. If you go looking for yourself, your soul, or God, you won't find anything. Now, you may find some things that you imagine or speculate or project are the self or God, like that. But there's no actual proof of any of these things. They are simply uh, our imagination, our speculation. If we look for them, we don't find them. There's a wonderful story about this. <laughs> Bodhidharma, who was the, I think, the 13th patriarch in uh, disciplic dissension from the Buddha, went to China. And on his way to China, of course, he met kings and various other people. And they wanted him to uh, train them, to give them some understanding. So one of these kings, some stories say that it was the emperor of China, but I kind of doubt that. Um, it was probably one of the emperors in the, or one of the kings in the Himalayas on the way to China. Anyway, this king came to Bodhidharma and said, please, my mind is giving me a lot of trouble. I'm always in anxiety, worrying about my job. <laughs> Am I going to be able to stay the king? Is somebody going to come and defeat me? Is somebody going to come and um, cause a revolution? Am I going to lose my position? Am I going to lose my money? What's going to happen? This mind is driving me crazy. Please help me deal with it. And Bodhidharma said, all right. You come here at four o'clock in the morning. And we'll sit down. And I'll take care of your mind. <laughs> and try to understand Bodhidharma was a big, strong guy. And he had this big staff that he used to carry. He was an expert, staff fighter. You had to be. To walk through the Himalayas alone, you had to be able to take care of robbers and wild animals or any other threat. So the next morning, four o'clock, the king shows up. Bodhidharma is there. All right, sit down. Now, bring me your mind. Show me your mind. And I'll take care of it. So the king is sitting there. And he's looking for his mind. And he's looking and looking. <laughs> he's sweating it, you know. Because Bodhidharma is this big guy. And he has a staff. 
and he knows how to use it. So the king is sitting there looking and looking, and after a long time, Bodhidharma says, all right, enough time now. Where is your mind? And the king goes, I can't find it. <laughs> I can't find it. All I can see is thoughts and thoughts and thoughts. I can't see anything like a mind. So you see, it's just like here in Norway. I'm looking out the window and I see so many trees. There are many trees, but where is the forest? Yeah, we can say, oh, this is this forest and that's that forest and like that. But these are just names that we give. In nature, there is no such thing as a forest. Forest is a concept that we overlay on top of the existence of the trees. The trees exist in nature. They grow spontaneously all by themselves. Nobody has to plant them. If we just leave them alone, they'll grow. Huh? But there is no such thing as a forest. That's our construct. That's our speculation. So similarly, things like I, mine, you, yours, the self, the mind, corporations, nations, religions, philosophies, these are all constructs. They're all simply concepts built with words and symbols. We talk about the mind, but what we really mean is there are thoughts. <laughs> and if we watch these thoughts, we see that they come into existence and then they float through the sky of our consciousness and then they disappear like clouds. When we look at a cloud, I can see a cloud out the window here. And the cloud appears to exist. Huh? But a few minutes ago, it wasn't there. It came into existence at a certain point, and then it floats along for a while, and then it sort of evaporates. So, what is the mind? The mind is simply an abstraction, a name for a collection of thoughts. Similarly, the self, or I, is simply an abstraction, a concept a name for a whole collection of phenomena that we arbitrarily designate as mine or myself. This is going on. So basically the path of yoga aims to strengthen the identification with self and I and mine and will and control, you see? until it reaches the ultimate stage where one is in control of everything. Well, that's a nice theory. But in practice, it leads to disappointment. It leads to failure. Because we can't control everything. We can't even control our own heartbeat. We can't even control our own digestion. Huh? If I get a cut on my hand, I can't control how long it takes to heal it. I can't make it heal faster just by wanting to. I mean, of course, by the way I treat it, I can, I can keep scratching it and, and make it last a lot longer. But you understand what I'm saying. These are natural processes. They're going on with or without our consent or knowledge or approval or intention. Now, there are some things we have control over. We can control our name and form, for example, by accepting or adopting a certain philosophy or view. And then everything that comes out from that is more or less mechanical by the process of nature, by the process of causality, paticca samuppada. So yes, there are some things that we can control. And the main thing that we can control is our view.
So if we have this view that success in spiritual life or success in development of consciousness means to increase our will, to increase our control and our domination and ownership of everything around us. Well, then you get something like Western civilization, which is in the process of destroying the whole planet right now. Because our understanding is flawed. Our understanding is deviates from nature's law. We can control and we can override and we can own things and exploit them and use them for a certain amount of time. But in the process, then we destroy them. It's just like when two people are in relationship. One person can identify themselves as the dominant person and be in charge and control the relationship. Well, what happens after a while, the other person goes, oh, wait a minute, I don't like this, and I'm going to withdraw from the relationship. So the relationship collapses. And something very similar is going on with the environment right now, worldwide. Because of this uh, yogic philosophy of will and control, and it's even happening in Buddhism. Buddhism, of course, is another abstraction, another construction, uh, another concept. But actually, what is there really? The Buddha, the Buddha's teaching, and some people who follow it to the best of their ability. There is no Buddhism. There is no religion. Huh? The Buddha didn't come to start a religion. He came to show us the truth. And the truth is that we can't really control anything, so why even start? Huh? We don't know what we're doing. We don't understand what the consequences of our control is going to be. Huh? Everything we try to do has unforeseen consequences, unforeseen problems that come up, isn't it? So why should we get in a struggle with nature and try to control it? However, we'll go into this in more detail in subsequent episodes. But the nature of the philosophy that was superimposed on the Buddha's original teaching was yogic philosophy based on the concept of control. Whereas the Buddha's original teaching is simply based on observation. Simply watch and see, look and understand what's happening, what we're doing, and how we're deviating from nature's laws. When we surrender to nature's law, when we allow things to just take their own course, then we're amazed how the suffering simply goes away. Whereas the more we try to control and dominate and manipulate and own, the more suffering we create for ourselves. Because things never work out the way we want them to, do they? So this is why we have to be cognizant of the difference between Buddhist philosophy, actual Buddhism, actual Buddha's teaching, and the false yogic philosophy that has been superimposed on it by the commentators and the religionists and clear that away to find the original, real, noble path. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta